Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at some different proof techniques uh, that we'll be seeing throughout the entirety of our course. Um, now, this uh, this doesn't really count as something that I would consider as review material necessarily. Uh, I am, I mean, depending on the classes that you took, 190, 191, 220, you've probably seen a mixture of proofs and other sort of theoretical concepts. Um, some of you guys might have seen more of that. Some of you might have seen less. So really, this, this idea of proof techniques is just to sort of talk a little bit and give some examples of it before we start encountering it in our class. And the reason that I think that this is sort of important or the reason that I sort of want to do this now is because when we start encountering it in our course, it's going to be sort of a twofold problem, right? When you guys see a proof in our class, not only is the material or content going to be new to you, but maybe the proof technique is going to be new as well. In these examples that we'll discuss in the video, though, all the concepts should be things that you're very comfortable with. We're going to do some uh, basic proofs about functions, about derivatives, uh, about numbers themselves, all things that you guys are familiar with. So you can really just focus on the proof techniques. And then when we encounter them again in our class, you'll be a little bit more comfortable with the proof technique itself. And then you can focus on how we're using it related to the content of our class. So again, this might be something that's review for you. It might be sort of new for you. Um, in no way is this going to be a comprehensive discussion of all proof techniques out there. I'm just going to highlight three main proof techniques that we will encounter at least several times each during our class. Uh, there are many, many other proof techniques out there, and some of these, to be honest, are very broad categories, but just want this to be a brief introduction into proof techniques. Um, after this video, if you still have additional questions about proofs and things, you can go on your uh, Canvas site and you can take a look at, there's several more proof examples similar to these that you guys can try. Again, all the material that they relate to are things that you've already seen in previous classes, functions, derivatives, continuity, etc. And you can try those to make sure that you're comfortable with how to write up a nice proof using one of these techniques. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first type. So the first and probably most basic proof technique out there is sort of this general category of what's called a direct proof. A direct proof is basically just something where when you're going to prove a statement, you're going to prove it directly. So you're going to basically show exactly what the statement says you need to show. Uh, sometimes direct proofs, uh, there's like a subcategory of direct proofs called like uh, proof by definition or, you know, um, proof by comparison. Like, there's a lot of sort of subcategories here, but a direct proof, as its name would imply, is basically just saying that we're going to prove directly what we needed to prove. Keep in mind, uh, as we start this also, when you're proving something in mathematics, you're proving it in general, right? When you say something is true, in other words, when you say you're going to prove it, you're saying that it is always true. So you're proving it in complete generality for every possible case. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. So this example says, let's recall that a function p of x is a polynomial. If p of x can be written in this format, a n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a 1 x plus a sub 0. All right, this is your sort of standard definition of what a polynomial is where n, uh, this exponent here, is a non-negative integer, meaning that the highest power has to be a non-negative integer. Theoretically, uh, that n could be 0, meaning that you just have p of x equals a constant. That does count as a polynomial, all the way up to where that could be like a x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, a non-negative integer. And of course, these a n, a n minus 1 down to a sub 0, those are all just real constants, so they're just real numbers. What we're going to prove, right, uh, this is just part of the definition for us to recall. Oftentimes, uh, whenever, if you have to generate your own proof, right, if it involves different sort of mathematical objects like a polynomial or something, it's probably a good idea to make sure you know the definition of that. Um, here we have those stated for us, but even if they're not stated, it might be a good idea to write those down. That's all pieces of information you might need. What we're going to try to prove is that if p of x is a polynomial, then its derivative, p prime of x, is also a polynomial. So we're basically proving that if you differentiate a polynomial, it remains a polynomial. All right. Now, most of us can see why this seems reasonable. Uh, it, it is to, to be true, right? I mean, if we think about polynomials in our head, um, something like, say, x squared, derivative of x squared, 2x. x squared is a polynomial, 2x is a polynomial. 
x cubed plus what? That's a polynomial. Derivative 3x squared, that's a polynomial. Now, is it a proof if we write down one of those examples? Absolutely not, right? Because what this statement is saying here, oh, not bad there, what this statement is saying here is that if p of x is any polynomial, then its derivative is a polynomial. So if you give several examples of polynomials that when you differentiate are also polynomials, then that doesn't show anything. All that shows is that it's true for those particular situations. You need to show that it's true in general. That means that, you know, oftentimes when you have to prove something in mathematics, it can be pretty challenging because you're having to prove it in complete generality for every possible case. So let's see how we're going to do this here. Well, well, first of all, since we have that P of X is a polynomial and we have this definition of what a polynomial means, we can say P of X is equal to a n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus da 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 plus a 1 x plus a sub 0. Right? We know this because we're assuming that p of x is a polynomial. Now, always a good idea to state in your proof what you're attempting to show. Um, often we abbreviate that as nts, meaning need to show. We need to show that p prime of x is a polynomial. Okay. So from here, then, what can uh, we've got this as a definition. We know we're starting with this, and this is where we need to end up. So in other words, at the beginning of your proof, you're sort of saying anything that you can assume to be true. Right? You know this because we know P of X is a polynomial. And then we need to show that P prime is a polynomial. All right. So we have this here. Let's go ahead and differentiate it and see what we can say about that. So P prime of X is a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus da 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 plus a 1 x plus a 0 all differentiated. Now uh, we know how derivatives apply over addition and constant multiplication. We know that this distribute this derivative here is going to distribute onto each of these term terms and it's just going to go on to each of these because these are constants here. So this then tells us that p prime of x is n a n x to the n minus 1 plus n minus 1 times a n minus 1 x to the n minus 2 plus dot 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 plus a 1 and then of course this guy here is going to be just 0. Okay so there's our derivative. Actually we're pretty much done with this proof because this right here if we really look at it actually is in the form of a polynomial. We have these x to different exponents here, each of which are going to be uh, non-negative integer exponents because they're just going from n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to technically what would be x to the 0 there. And then, of course, in front of this, we just have these constants here. If you want to make this a little bit clearer to someone who's reading your proof, right, this stuff might be a little bit messy to people. So we can sort of uh, redefine, we can sort of let b sub n minus 1 equal n a n, and we can say b n minus 2 is n minus 1 times a n minus 1, and da, 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 da. we can go all the way down to b sub 0 is a 1, and that's just redefining the constants. So then this we can look at it as b n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus b n minus 2 x to the n minus 2 plus da 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 plus b 0. Okay. This is exactly the form of a polynomial that we defined up here. Obviously, the constants are just constants, so it doesn't matter if they're a's or b's or whatever. We know that they're still real numbers. So we can then say, so p prime of x is a polynomial. And then uh, that's the end of your proof. You've shown that the derivative is guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be a polynomial. Uh, you can put a little check mark if you like, or you can be very fancy and put a QED, uh, Latin for quotes demonstratum, that which needed to be shown has been shown, right? Very, very uh, fancy to stick that at the end of a proof, but there we go. Now, what's so important about this? Well, I mean, this is a very simple direct proof here. We showed exactly just what we needed to show directly, but keep in mind what we said here. We've done this for every possible polynomial. So it doesn't matter if the polynomial is very simple, like x squared or x cubed plus 1, or it's some crazy messy polynomial, 5x to the 7th minus 13x to the 4th plus 17x minus 10. doesn't matter, right? We've shown that in general, if you start in this format, 
Once you differentiate, you remain in this format. And all we needed to do was basically start with this format, differentiate it, take a look at what the derivative results in, and then recognize and basically just say either in words or in some notation that this result is in the format of a polynomial, so we know that the result is guaranteed to be a polynomial. So direct proofs are pretty straightforward. Um, we'll see uh, several examples of direct proofs right at the beginning of our class, and we'll see some different ways of writing them up. This is a sort of line-by-line -line approach. We'll see some examples of direct proofs where we sort of do a left-hand side, right-hand side approach where we're trying to show some sort of equality, and we work on both sides of an equation. Um, it'll still be a similar idea, but just be aware of direct proofs, um, pretty straightforward, going to be one of the first type of proof techniques that we make use of. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at a second proof technique that's a little bit more advanced. So we're going to take a look at a concept called proof by contradiction. So a proof by contradiction is a little bit more advanced in terms of the logic behind a, this, this proof technique. A proof by contradiction basically says that we're going to assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove. So in other words, we're going to assume that what we're trying to prove is not true. And then we're going to follow that to its natural conclusion. We're going to find that that natural conclusion gives us something that we know is invalid, that we know is a contradiction. And that means that that initial assumption is incorrect. Well, if that initial assumption is that, we, that what we are trying to prove is not true, well, if we know that that's incorrect, then we know that it is true. A proof by contradiction is sort of the proof example of if you know like a friend of yours is wrong and they keep telling you, no, I'm right, I'm right, and you say, okay, let's do exactly what you said. You let them do exactly what they said. You let them, you know, they say that they know where they're going and you just let them go. They go to the wrong place and you say, well, that shows you didn't know where you were going because it's a proof by contradiction. You sort of follow the assumption that you think is wrong all the way to its logical conclusion, find out that it's a incorrect conclusion, and then go back and say, well, I must throw out that assumption. So let's take a look at an example here about how you actually sort of write out and use a proof by contradiction. So let's recall that a number is considered rational if it can be written in the form p over q, where p and q are integers. Remember, rational numbers are just basically numbers that are fractions. Right? They, if you can write it as a fraction where the numerator and denominator are just integers, either just positive or negative whole numbers, then that's what we call a rational number. Further recall that we have this fancy definition that if a number is not rational, if you can't write it in that fractional form with numerator and denominator being integers, then we call it irrational. So all numbers out there are either irrationals or irrationals. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to prove that the square root of 2 is an example of an irrational number. Now, before we get into this proof, I want you guys to sort of see why this is a great example of a proof by contradiction. The reason that this is sort of a good choice of, for using proof by contradiction is that notice that the definition of being irrational isn't a particularly useful definition. The definition of being irrational is that you are not rational. That's it. That's all we can say. When you say something is irrational, all you're saying is that it's not rational. Notice, though, that when we say things are rational, we have a very sort of concise and lots of information definition. If something's rational, we know it's of this form, p over q. Just like how in the previous example, if something is a polynomial, we have a lot of information about exactly what it looks like. So whenever you're working with something that doesn't have a particularly informative definition, sometimes a proof by contradiction can be useful so that instead of working with irrationals here, we can sort of work with rationals, which we actually have a nice definition of. So let's see how to do this. So we'll start with our need to show. We need to show that square root of 2 is irrational. So we're going to try this proof by contradiction. So proof by contradiction. Let's go ahead and assume the opposite. So we're going to assume square root of 2 is rational. So we're going to make this single assumption that square root of 2 is rational. We'll do some work down here. We'll come to some nonsense conclusion. And then because this leads to some nonsense, we'll know that this assumption is incorrect. We'll throw out this assumption. We'll say that root 2 is not rational, which will mean that it is irrational. 
So let's go ahead and see what we can do here. So we're assuming that square root of 2 is rational. Since we've assumed that square root of 2 is rational, we know that it can be written in this form. So there exists. And sometimes when you say there exists, you'll see a fancy notation backwards e. Uh, there exists p and q integers such that whenever you see this sort of colon, that just means such that uh, square root of 2 equals p divided by q. We can go a little bit further here, and since we're saying that square root of 2 can be written as a fraction, we can also say, and GCD, the greatest common divisor of P and Q, is equal to 1. All this is basically saying is that when we write it in that fractional form, we've simplified the fraction, meaning that if there's any common factors between P and Q, we've actually divided those out. So, just to restate here, what we're saying is that since square root of 2 is rational, we can therefore say that there exists these integers, p and q, so that the square root of 2 equals p divided by q, and that p and q have no common factors. Again, there exists can be just be rewritten with a backwards e like this. So if you ever look at sort of a more formal proof, you'll see it's shorthanded as this backwards e. And this colon here just means such that. All right, so now we have that square root of 2 equals p over q. So what can we do with this? Well, this is an equation, so we can do operations. Let's go ahead and square both sides. So this tells us that 2 equals p squared over q squared. And uh, not much else we can really do with this, but let's just bring over that uh, q squared. And let's get that 2q squared is equal to p squared. All right. Now, let's think about what this tells us. So this tells us that 2 times q squared is equal to p squared. That tells us sort of an interesting fact, though, right? If you multiply something by 2, you know that the result is even. So we then know, so p squared is an even number. We know that because 2 times anything, doesn't matter what q is, if you multiply by 2, it's going to be an even number, so p squared is an even number. Well, if you think about it, if p squared is an even number, p has to be an even number. So p is an even number. That should make a little bit of sense, even though it's a little bit of a jump, right? Uh, if p was an odd number and you multiply it with itself, which is what squaring does, it's not going to suddenly magically become an even number because we know odd times odd is odd, even times even is even. So if the square is even, the actual number itself must be even. All right, so p is an even number. But now let's go back and think about what we can say about q. So notice that we can also say that q squared is equal to p squared over 2, right? This was sort of phrasing things in terms of what we can say about p. This is saying stuff in terms of what we can say about q. All right, now let's think about what we said here. So we know that p is an even number, which means that p squared is divisible by 4. Since p squared is even... Oh, sorry. Since p is even, my bad. Since p is an even number, p squared is divisible by 4. How do we know that? Well, if you're an even number, you're divisible by 2. And if we have a pair of even numbers that have been multiplied together, which is what the square is, then you know it's got to have at least a factor of 4. So if p squared is divisible by 4 and you divide it by 2, it's still divisible by 2, meaning it's even. So p squared over 2 is an even number. Well, if p squared over 2 is an even number, then q is an even number. So q squared is an even number. So q is an even number. All right, so what have we done? We figured out that p must be an even number, and we figured out that q is an even number. Might not seem like a big deal, but it actually is our contradiction. Why is this our contradiction? Well, if we go back up here, remember, we said that there's got to exist these integers, so that square root of 2 is p divided by q. And we said that we can simplify that so that there's no common factors between p and q. In other words, that the GCD of p and q is 1. But what we just figured out is that p has to be an even number and q has to be an even number, which means that they are going to share a common factor of at least 2. So that's our contradiction. Thus, okay, GCD 
of p comma q not equal to 1, which is a contradiction. Okay, so we made this assumption that square root of 2 is rational. We did all this work in here, and we ended up at a contradiction. We said that we could, that the GCD of P and Q must be 1, but it turns out that it can't be 1 because they're both guaranteed to be even numbers. So how do we get to this sort of nonsense conclusion where we knew that the GCD was supposed to be 1 and then we found that, it, that it's not 1? Well, we only made one assumption at the beginning. The assumption was that the square root of 2 is rational. Since that led us to nonsense, that must mean that that assumption was incorrect. So we can say, so square root of 2 is not rational. So square root of 2 is irrational. So we did it. Put our check mark, or if you prefer, you can put your QED. So there we go. There's a proof by contradiction. Big idea in a proof by contradiction is if you're trying to prove something that doesn't have a particularly informative definition or you're not sure really how to prove it directly, notice that nothing in this basically told us how to show something is irrational. Showing something irra is irrational is basically showing that it's not rational. So we assume that it was rational, followed that through all this, right? I mean, a little bit messy here. We're not going to be doing a lot of stuff about even and odd, like parody arguments like this. So you don't have to worry so much about uh, do you really follow why these things are even or odd or whatever. But this is just an example of that. But really the idea is this logical structure, right? We followed this to its natural conclusion. It came out to where it contradicted something we knew had to be true. So that was our contradiction. We got to throw out our assumption, and we actually proved the thing we were trying to prove. So there we go. We've got one last proof technique that we'd like to talk about, which is probably the most specialized. Um, this one you guys have probably encountered beforehand. Um, it's proof by induction. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So proof by induction. Uh, mathematical induction is a really powerful uh, proving technique, and we will use it several times throughout our course. In just a moment, we'll use it on this example. We'll prove a summation formula. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what proof by induction really is. So proof by induction is a can probably best be summarized in a little bit of sort of a metaphor. It's basically trying to prove something where you have an infinite amount of things that you're trying to prove. Notice that like this summation formula is basically saying that it's true for n greater than or equal to 1. So it's it's true from 1 to 1, it's true from 1 to 2, it's true from 1 to 100, it's true from 1 to a million, whatever, right? It's true for all those different situations. So we're not just trying to prove one thing, we're trying to prove a whole group or almost whole family of different statements here. So proof by induction is sort of the mathematical equivalent of showing that you can climb an in infinite staircase. So let's imagine that there's some giant staircase, right? Some infinite staircase that continues forever. And you need to try to show that you can climb that staircase. Now, obviously, what you could do is you could start down here. There's you, woohoo, right? I guess you're, I don't know if you'd be smiling, so maybe you're sad because this is an infinite staircase, right? And one thing you could try to do is you could just try to climb the staircase. So you could get onto the first step, you go down the second step, then the third step, then the fourth step, and just try to climb the entire thing. That would be us going through and manually showing that this works from one to one, then showing it works from one to two, then showing it works from one to three, one to four, one to five. But of course, you'll never finish because it's an infinite staircase or it's an infinite set of things you're trying to prove. So a superior way is to figure out some way of proving that you can do this without having to show every individual piece. So proof by induction has two moments. The first moment is what we call the sort of base case. The base case basically says that here you are, I guess sad that you have to climb the staircase. Base case just shows that you can climb onto the staircase. In other words, that you can make that first step and get onto the staircase. Then the second part of mathematical induction says that if you have this infinite staircase, you have whoever is challenging you to climb this staircase, right? Whatever terrible friend you have that wants you to climb this staircase. And you say, okay, put me on any arbitrary step you like, right? anyone you like, and I'll show you how I step forward. I'll show you how I take one step forward. So we imagine that you're sort of already up here, 
right, there you are. And we call this like the kth step. And then we show that you can step forward to the k plus what. So the idea is that you show that you can step onto the staircase and you show that you know how to go from one stair to the next. If you can do those two things, well, then we know that you can step onto the staircase. And since you know how to take any one step, you step onto the staircase, then you can do the next one, then you can do the next one, you can do the next one. And by mathematical induction, by linking these two things together, you can get onto the staircase and then go up the entire thing. So this is mathematical induction. And again, this is what's called the inductive step here. All right, so let's try these on this. So this tells us that every mathematical induction is going to involve two pieces, a base case and the inductive step. So let's go ahead and try this proof by induction here. So let's do our base case. So the base case is wherever you start from here, we're saying that this holds for n greater than or equal to 1. So the base case would be n equals to 1. So what we need to show is we need to show that this formula holds when n equals 1. So this would be a great chance to use a left-hand side, right-hand side approach. So let's look at what the left-hand side looks like. The left-hand side would be the sum from k equals 1 to 1, because we're assuming that n equals 1 of k. And if we think about what that actually is equal to, that's just equal to 1. The right-hand side which is this expression here. We'd plug in 1 to that, and it would be 1 times 1 plus 1 divided by 2. If we simplify that, uh, that's going to be 1 times 2 over 2, and of course that's going to be equal to 1. So the left-hand side of this expression at n equals 1 is 1. The right-hand side of this expression at n equals 1 is 1. So these two things agree. So left-hand side equals right-hand side, check. So what we've basically shown is that this formula works at least at n equals 1. All right, now we're ready to actually do the inductive step. So the inductive step. For the inductive step, remember, you get to have your friend carry you up to an arbitrary step. Now, normally we use k as the arbitrary step, but k is actually already used as a variable in here. So um, we'll probably have to use something else. I guess maybe we'll call it like, uh, I, I don't know, maybe x, right? So let's just assume, or let's use z since x is often used for other things. Let's just, for the inductive step, right? we get to assume the formula holds for n equals z. So we get to assume that it works at step z. So in other words, our friend is carrying us up to step z, and we have to show them how to get to step z plus 1. So we need to show the formula holds for n equals z plus 1. All right, so we get to assume that it holds for n equals z. We need to show that it holds for n equals z plus 1. So since we get to assume that the formula holds for n equals z, we get to assume that the sum from k equals 1 to z of k is equal to z, z plus 1 over 2. In other words, we get to assume this formula at this particular moment when n equals z. So we get to assume that. And if we write out what we need to show, we need to show that the sum from k equals 1 to z plus 1 of k is z plus 1, z plus 1, plus 1, over 2. So that's what we need to show. So how do you generally do inductions? Well, start with your assumption and work your way to your need to show. That's usually the easiest way. So... Let's go ahead and see if we can do that. Well, we have got our need to show. We can start from here and try to work our way over to this guy here. So we can say that the sum from k equals 1 to z plus 1 of k. What can we say about this? Well, we can sort of say that we can think about this summation in terms of this one here. We can think about this guy as the sum from k equals 1 to z of k 
plus the very last term, which is z plus 1. All right, this is basically saying if you're summing up the numbers from 1 to z plus 1, you can sum up the numbers from 1 to z and then add on that z plus 1, the last term. But now we know that this here, by our inductive hypothesis, is equivalent to this right here. So we can say this is the same as z, z plus 1 over 2 plus z plus 1. Not a bad idea to put a little IH over this equality because this reminds somebody who's reading the proof that this moment of going from here to here is the inductive hypothesis, what we got to assume there. That's what the name of this thing is. This is often referenced as the inductive hypothesis. So not a bad idea to just mention when you're using it. Now we can simplify this thing by maybe multiplying this out. I guess this is z squared plus z over 2 plus 2z plus 2 over 2 to make some common denominators. Uh, then it looks like that's z squared plus 3z plus 2 over 2. And then that looks like we could factor it as z plus 1z plus 2 over 2. And I guess if you want it to be really clear, since this is what we were technically trying to show, we can view this as z plus 1 z plus 1 plus 1, all over 2. And notice that we've now shown that this is equivalent to this. So in other words, if we are on step z, it, we can get to step z plus 1. So check and QED. Thus, we've shown, right? Uh, maybe we don't, we don't want to stick our QED just yet, because we can summarize what we actually showed there. Thus, the sum from k equals 1 to n of k equals n n plus 1 over 2 for n greater than or equal to 1. Check in QED there. Right. This is what we've shown. We've now shown that it holds for all n greater than or equal to 1 because we did our base case here and we did our inductive step. Now, uh, induction, again, is sort of a very specialized technique. It's a very powerful one. Um, it's commonly used on these types of things when you need to prove a whole range of statements that usually hold for some, like, index for that n greater than or equal to 1. Also keep in mind, especially, like, if you guys try some of the examples on Canvas of proving by induction, that the main work in a proof by induction is in this inductive step. But you do need to make sure you do the base case. And when you're doing the base case, it should be very simple. The base case should be something that is very clear and easy, but you do need to show it, right? If you're doing a tremendous amount of work to prove the base case, then you're probably not interpreting what you're trying to prove correctly. Okay, so that gives you guys a quick summary of three major proof techniques that we'll be using in our class. Applied to just some basic concepts um, that you probably have already encountered before. The last thing I'd like to do in this video is talk a little bit about looking at the opposite perspective. In these three examples, we tried to prove in general that some statement was always true. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about how you show that something is not true. In other words, how you show something is false. And that's through an idea called counterexamples. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. So. This is just going to be a brief discussion about counterexamples. Counterexamples are really, really important in mathematics because when you see something that is incorrect, you have to be able to give a quick and clear and concise way for somebody to understand why it's incorrect. You can't just say, oh, that's wrong. You want to be able to give them an example of why that statement is wrong. So in general, something you should, guys should always keep in mind is that proving something you're proving something is true. And that's very challenging because proving something is true is proving that it is always true. Showing something is false is much easier because showing something is false is showing one single example that it is false. So those proofs were done in generality. These are counterexamples that will just show that something is false for one particular moment. So let's get into talking about these and see some examples of it. So. Let's go ahead and take a look at each of these statements. We're told that each of them are false, but we want to get, provide a counterexample. So let's look at A here. A says that if f of x and g of x are differentiable functions, then the derivative of f of x times g of x is equal to f prime of x times g of x. Now, we know that this is incorrect. If somebody told you that, you would say, no, that's wrong. That's not the product rule. 
But, of course, what you're saying is that's not right because there's some rule that tells me it's not right. But somebody could say, well, maybe this also works. How do we know that this doesn't work? Well, what you'd like to do is you'd like to give them a counterexample that shows that it doesn't work. All right. When you try to come up with a counterexample, there should be probably an infinite amount of counterexamples out there, but you want to try to come up with one that's clean and easy. So for A here, what do we need? We need two functions that are both differentiable. Then we're going to look at their derivative of their product and show that it's not the product of their derivatives. So let's let f of x equal x and g of x equal what? So let's just try very easy basic functions. So let's go ahead then and take a look. Then f of x, g of x prime is x times 1 prime, which is x, the derivative of x. What's the derivative of x? Well, no one would doubt that it is 1. So this would be equal to 1. What about f prime times g prime? Well, we know that f prime would be 1, g prime would be 0. So this would be 1 times 0, which is 0. Notice that these two things, not equal. So there's our counterexample. If somebody ever says that's how you differentiate a product, you can just pull out this example immediately and say, well, these two are not equal, so that's clearly not how you differentiate a product. Could you come up with other counterexamples? Sure, you could come up with some crazy ones. You could say, let's let f of x be e to the x and g to the of x be sine of 7x plus 9. And if you do this and you do this, you'll get two different things. But this is such a clear and concise example that there can be no doubt. So there's sort of an elegance to coming up with a nice, easy example when you're trying to show something is false. All right. Let's take a look at b here. For b, it says we've got these constants, x, y, and k. So they're all just constants. They're all just real numbers. And we know that x is less than y. So we know that the number x is less than the number y. Then we're saying that kx is less than ky. So if we multiply by k on both sides, we're guaranteed that kx is less than ky. Now, this might seem like a true statement, right? You're just multiplying both sides, but we know that it's false, so let's think of a counterexample. So we need to think of three constants, and we need it to be where x is less than y, but this is not true. So let's do it nice and easy. Let's just let x equal 1, y equal 2. Notice that they definitely have that property. And what's going to sort of invalidate this or what's going to make this sort of false? Well, let's pick k equal to negative 1. Then, certainly, x is less than y. Check. Right? We can even say since 1 is less than 2. Check. But, but kx is not less than ky. Since kx is actually going to be negative 1 is not less than negative 2. And there we go. So there's our counterexample. If x is 1 and y is 2 and k is negative 1, then if we multiply negative 1 on both sides, we no longer have that kx is less than ky. Now, interestingly enough, if you guys want to try on your own to come up with a counterexample, um, this statement is true if you pick any k that's a positive number. If you pick k is like 3, then if 1 is less than 2, then 3 is less than 6. But what invalidates this is the choice of k as a negative constant. So sometimes you do have to be a little bit clever. Right? Some of these statements uh, could be true at certain situations, but it's not uniformly true. And remember, when somebody writes a statement in mathematics and says this is true, they mean that it's always true. So a single counterexample like this invalidates this entire statement. Now, could we change it into a true statement? Sure. If we said, suppose x, y, and k are all constants, and x is less than y, and k is greater than zero, then xk is less than ky. That would be actually true, because since k is guaranteed to be positive, multiplying it on both sides isn't going to change the direction of the inequality. But again, in this case, there was none of that assumption, so we gave a counterexample that showed why it's false. All right, for part C here, we've got that f of x is a continuous function, and we have that the integral, the definite integral from 0 to 1 of f of x is equal to 0. Then the function is uniformly 0 for all x in 0 to 1. 
Now, this one is a little bit denser to unpack, right? This is basically saying that if the definite integral of a function over this interval 0 to 1 is equal to 0, then the function must be 0 on that interval. Why is there this mention of f of x is continuous? Well, always a good idea to think about why that might be stated here. This is probably just in this statement because if you're not continuous, then you're non-integrable, right? So by saying that you're continuous, we know that this integral makes sense here. So let's think about if we can come up with a counterexample. This is one is here mainly to show you guys a way of giving like a visual counterexample. So let's go ahead and think about f of x, right? Remember that the definite integral is equivalent to the area under the curve on that interval. So if that area is going to be zero, what we could have is obviously the function itself could just be there, or there could be a matching amount of positive and negative area. So let's go ahead and just say that, you know, there's maybe one there. What if we had something that, you know, we'll just say that that's one half. If we had something that came straight through like that, and there we go. So maybe there's our function f of x, right? And then we're saying that the positive area, this stuff here, would exactly match the negative area right there. But of course, this function is not uniformly zero on uh, zero to one. Now, once we have our diagram, could we use that to actually figure out what the explicit function is? Sure, right? This is like the example I used is just a line there. Uh, and it looks like it's a line uh, that if we, I guess if we sort of, uh, well, we didn't really define the values here, but I suppose we could just call that uh, negative one, and we could call that uh, positive one there to keep it balanced. Uh, so it looks like this guy uh, would have like what slope uh, negative two and intercept one. So uh, our counter example is f of x equals negative two x plus one on zero to one. And if we really wanted to confirm, we can actually check integral zero to one negative 2x plus 1 dx. Uh, that's negative x squared plus x evaluated from uh, 0 to 1, which is negative 1 plus 1 minus uh, 0, which is going to be equal to 0, but minus, but f of x equals minus 2x plus 1 is not uniformly 0 on zero to one. So there we go, there's our counterexample. But notice that we were able to sort of arrive at the counterexample by making use of this sort of diagram and realizing, yeah, I mean, the area under this curve is equal to zero because there's negative, there's positive and negative areas and they're sort of canceling out. That doesn't mean that the function itself is uniformly zero. Certainly if the function was uniformly zero, so just a horizontal line at y equals zero, the area under the curve would also be zero. So this statement is true at moments, but in general, it's false, and here's a nice counterexample of it. To be honest, um, I would probably accept just the visual counter argument here because it's so clear. You don't even really need to confirm this, but if you wanted to see really formally, once you had your picture, you can sort of use that to come up with that very explicit counterexample. Last thing I'd like to say about this, since we will be often using uh, counterexamples to show why things are not true, uh, notice that whenever you give a counterexample, even on something like A, where we know it's just not true. We know that that's not how you differentiate products. You always wanna be able to give an explicit counterexample. You wanna to get to that actual example, say this is the function, this is the number, whatever, and here's why it doesn't work in that case. And that shows that this rule is not a rule overall. So this gives you guys some theoretical things to think about as we begin into our course, which will start in the next video going over 1.1 and 1.2. We'll start to encounter proofs and things like that, and we'll make use of the techniques and ideas presented here. But again, this video really is just to try to get you guys a little bit of a reminder or bring you up to speed about just some different ways of thinking theoretically when working in these mathematical topics. In the next video, we'll be moving on to actually starting the content for our class with sections 1.1 and 1.2.